Azazel, Prince of Damnation, Captain of the New, Warriors of Chaos, Slanesh Faction, the Ecstatic Legion. One of four brand new campaigns arriving with the new Champions of Chaos DLC, landing August 23rd for Total War Warhammer 3. In this video today, I want to quickly give you a spoiler-free overview of Azazel's campaign, starting out by going over his campaign mechanics, skills, tech tree, and then at the end of the video, we'll discuss what his Immortal Empire start is like and answer the question, is this campaign right for you? The goal here is not to give you a full-fledged guide, but rather break down the campaign from the first turn to give you an idea of whether or not this campaign will fit your playstyle. You can quickly navigate to any part of the video that interests you the most by using the chapters in both the timeline and the description. Also, if you intend on picking up the Champions of Chaos DLC coming out and want to support the channel, you can find a link in the description and pinned comment to Creative Assembly's reseller program that will give you a Steam or Epic Game Store key for whichever platform platform you prefer. Please only pre-order if you're definitely going to get the game. Feel free to wait for any kind of reviews or the actual launch as this link will work for one week after launch as well. But let's get started here on the new campaign for Azazel. So here we are at turn one for Azazel. And a lot of the mechanics are going to be the same thing that we've already talked about with the other three of the Champions of Chaos, but just to kind of go through them right now. Um, let's click over here and to take a look at Humanity's Bane, the faction effect for... That's such a weird stance for Azazel. But Diplomatic Relations 80 with Empire, Kiss of Cathay, and Bretonia. Vassals gain immune to psychology and spread Slaneshi corruption. Remember, all four of the Champions of Chaos have this ability. He can also seduce units, including me, and applies and benefits from seductive influence and gifts to so of Slanesh. So um, we'll talk about that in just a second, but gifts of Slanesh are really huge, and hopefully we'll be able to get one from this auto resolve we're going to go through right now. If not, I'll load up a game that's got one and we'll show it off. But if you want to know more about the lore of Azazel, I have got a link in the upper right hand corner here uh, where we did some fancy voice work and everything, but Azazel has a really cool lore linked to uh, Sigmar. So you can go ahead and check that out in the upper right hand corner. Now, if we look further into this, we can see that he has the same path as Zanbaijin mechanic that we've seen with all the other Champions of Chaos so far. And remember, this is not a like race. You do have to get um, 50,000 total souls and then get your Rift Sigils, but the Rift Sigils simply open up rifts across the map for you to take advantage of. You don't have to deal with the Chaos Realm mechanic in that you have to go to the Chaos Realm and you have to fight through all that. And the rifts are just a means to jump across the map and have fun exploring and destroying things. So there's no real pressure. There is a final battle at the end of this, though. So you'll you'll have to deal with that once you contend to there. You also get the Eye of the Gods mechanic, the Gifts of Chaos, which we'll go through, as well as the Authority System. Remember, this is all linked to the new Warriors of Chaos rework. Guess what? Check in the upper right-hand corner because I went over that in its own video as well but with the big focus here for azazel it's going to be on slanesh units and with that you get of course these units that will upgrade to either undivided or slaneshi counterparts and remember slanesh does not have a very fleshed out um marked roster and we're going to go over the mark two here but you can see we have marauders we have warriors and we have chosen all three other standard edition or with Hell Scourges. Hell Scourges, just keep in mind if you do upgrade anyone to Hell Scourges, you lose out on armor piercing. That's something I totally forgot about. Your typical Marauder still has seven armor piercing that they retain. But if you jump into a Hell Scour Scourge variant, you get 10 melee defense, but you lose all armor piercing, which... Again, just wanted to kind of point that out. But then you have your uh, mounted units, your chariots, as well as your Forsaken and your spawns. No... Um, no, uh, it's, it's interesting that you can't... Well, well I guess it's, it's aspiring champions that go to uh, spawn, so never mind, never mind. R ignore what I said. But again, you have the Mark of Sinesh here, and the way that this works, it's going to be giving you immune to psychology, which is quite nice. The Strider attribute, just to hover over that really quick. It allows you speed and combat penalties caused by terrain are ignored by this unit, which is quite lovely. Also, you're going to get an increase to your physical resistance and an increase to your speed. So physical resistance is 10%. And just to give you an idea of what that speed difference is, you're getting a 5 speed difference on just your standard Chaos warriors so it's a pretty substantial ben uh, um, speed bonus you'll notice that your uh, Slaneshi warriors will outpace your standard edition warriors um, no in addition to this too you have the seductive influence meaning that you can use souls to dominate a faction this forces vassalage and that's a very strong capability especially because that is kind of how these campaigns work for the warriors of chaos is generating vassals having these vassals generate tribute back to you and also have these vassals do war targets for you so 
This is an example of a character you think would kind of uh, be quickly dominated, but that is not the case with the Zazel. Um, you, you, as soon as you start taking some of the stuff in the Imperial Wardens, this will drastically drop down. But again, this is a big portion of it. And we're going to quickly try this auto resolve and see if we get lucky and get a gift of Slanesh going here. But gifts of Slanesh are also very important for Nakari, but extremely important here for Azazel. So let's see what happens here. And we're just, it doesn't really matter here. We'll just press a button. Gift of Slanesh. Aha! Okay, so. This Gift of Slanesh is pretty important because this Gift of Slanesh is going to give us a passive bonus here. Um, in fact, I don't think I can... Yeah, okay. Let me boot up a save that's got a gift and I can show that off to you. So that same character in this other playthrough, they have a gift and you can see that it has a reduction to seduce unit cost, Slanesh corruption increase, leadership minus 8 when fighting against Slaneshi factions, and seductive influence plus 8 per turn for character's faction. All those kind of standard run of the mills things. But the big thing here is souls plus 25 per turn to the faction that provided the gift of Slanesh. That is a really big crucial thing for you when you're playing Azazel because you want to have a nice kind of passive income of souls. If you kind of think of this, um, you can get two gifts on two different characters and that will pretty much completely wash out the upkeep of a very low tier gift of chaos. So you again, you can see how these gifts of Sinesh are very important. So let's jump now into the tech tree. Before we jump into technology, let's go over the skills for Azazel as they are pretty sweet here. Looking at his stat line, he has very low armor, so you want to keep that in mind. He has a moderate amount of melee defense at 55, but 70 melee attack and magic damage, as well as a staggering amount of 500 AP weapon strength here. 375 of that just raw AP damage. Now he starts with Lash of Slanesh and Acquiescence, as you would imagine, because he's a Slanesh caster, but he has a ton of passive abilities. He causes terror for one. He has Encourage. Strider, Devastating Flanker, things that we know. He's demonic, which is he's the only um, champion of chaos that starts demonic. The other ones become demonic. Has your mark of Slanash, which gives you stuff like Strider and whatnot. Um, but he also has Dominary Aura. Now that is part of his Prince of Damnation trait here, which Seduce Units cost is minus 20% for Empire, Bretonia, Kislev, and Cafe, and Seduce Units budget is increased by 25%. And trust me, you want to use that Seduce Unit thing. It is so crucial to really kind of getting the, the leg up in the early portions of the game. But Domineering Aura here is going to have a cascading effect of decreasing the melee attack and defense by a total of 10 for effect intensity increased by each enemy unit in range with leadership wavering or lower. So which is really nice because he can fly, so he can just kind of be a flying bomb of terror lowering people's leadership, which is lovely, of course. Moving into his skill line, everything here is, as you would imagine, uh, the blue line, the red line, the his casting and yellow line are all the same. Some things to kind of highlight, though, we have the Dark Seducer, which is the uh, Sineshi trait that is unique to him. Well, unique to Sineshi Lords, and this is going to be campaign movement, souls, income, and Sinesh corruption. Also, of course, is the Devoted to of Chaos ability, which is actually, I'd say amongst all of the champions, it's the strongest on Azazel because he starts around nothing but forces of order. You're going to fight and immediately vassalize a uh, Norskin tribe, and then it's just off to fight in cafe. So you can see that this is gonna give you a 20% total increased experience gain when fighting forces of order, and 15% souls gained from battles, which is crucial to your overall objective um, in or outside of Immortal Empires. You just, you need souls, like, like, like a mofo. Now, looking into his, oh, uh, also with the red line, it has been changed with the Warriors of Chaos rework. Um, rather than it being unit specific, it is now either non-demonic or demonic unit type so for example all non-demonic infantry units or this one over here all non-demonic demonic i guess demonic non-demonic cavalry and chariot units so just kind of choose the ones that you have making up the army composition that you have going for you uh, with slanesh you're probably going to have a ton of infantry with a good amount of demonic um, cav and chariot units, right? So for his specific units, he gets unmatched ability, gives him, or I'm sorry, unmatched beauty, which gives him the ability, Temptator, which is going to have a melee reflection of 25 and damage resistance of 20% for 19%. Uh, what? 19 seconds. <laughs> also, he gets a bonus to Phantasmagoria here. Phantasmagoria being this ability right here, so it's going to, he's going to be able to give some uh, uh, cooldown reduction and, um, 
Oh no, just wins and magic cost reductions on it. Then for drive for perfection, character experience gain plus 15%, which is really nice to getting things into that mark uh, territory. Also melee attack plus five for embedded heroes. Impeccable taste, passive ability, soul feeder, which is gonna allow him to uh, give a passive regen on health if he's casting spells, which is awesome. Also souls gain from battle 15%. That's gonna stack with this bad boy. That's a 30% 30% gain in his soul's gain from battle. Serpent's Kiss is going to give him Serpentine Tail. This is the same one that you see when you're playing on the uh, Demon Prince Undivided, right? Daniel, as it is. And then a bonus versus Infantry of 12. Ecstatic Adoration is going to give him Control Local Province, uh, which is nice because he has a lot of gifts that reduce control and increase income. So you control, just like with Nakari's campaign, is something you play with as a point of your um, faction mechanic. Then Casualty Replenishment plus 6%. Lastly, Paradise Found is going to give him some authority. Path to Glory minus 25% soul cost to upgrade characters to a Demon Prince of Slanesh, which is, he's the only one who gets any kind of bonus like that. Path to Glory minus 25% cost to devote to Slanesh, which is even better. Stacking with that research, so you can get a minus 50% to the total cost to dedicate anyone to Slanesh, which is just lovely. Passive Ability, Paragon of Excess, and a further, a further Hex of, of melee attack. So at its peak, he will be reducing people's melee attack by 15, which is quite juicy, right, in close combat. Supple and Spry, which is uh, words you would use to describe me. Voice of Dark Gods, Leadership Aura, and Hearts of Iron. Remember, this is a Vigor Loss Reduction for the army, which is juicy. And then Paradise of Pleasure, uh, which is uh, going to just help reduce Corn Authority, which is never going to be a thing for you, and increase your Slanesh Authority. So, oh, 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 quest items. We also have the Demon Blade here. Uh, this is going to give him this juicy ability, which is going to cause Discouraged. This is going to play into his mechanic of Domineering Aura. Also gives him a nice bonus to his base and AP damage. Slanesh Authority, Seduce Units Budget plus 10%, 5 melee attack, and then 10% weapon strength. Really keep an eye on that Seduce Units Budget. This was something I was saying during Nakari, is that there's probably going to be a lore that's focused really heavily on seduction, and it is a Zazel, right? You get all these. So this unit's budget is 10%, so you now have a 35% bonus from him as a character. And doesn't this one? Okay, no, no, it does not. I think he has a, a, a thing here, and we'll go into this just a little bit. No budget increase here. Okay, Demonic Aid does. So he has a ways to really increase his seduction budget. So really take advantage of that, like I've said many, many times. So let's now transition into technology. So looking at the tech tree, it is very much like every other of the new Champions of Chaos, and it is a, a kind of singularly focused Slaneshi tech tree, of course, different from the other Warriors of Chaos that are undivided, that they can have branches. This is, again, just Slanesh. But... As always, it has a stain, the same style here. So looking at this, it's going to give you a bonus per active gift of Slanesh and reduce the amount of or the uh, cost for um, devoting units to Slanesh or uh, heroes to Slanesh. In this case, it's speed. Fleshbound Book. This is the one that's going to give soporific musk attacks for aspiring champion and chosen of Slanesh, which is so strong, and a cooldown reduction for Slanesh and shadow spells. Debauched Designs is going to allow unlocks warband upgrade cost reduction effect for dark fortresses. Your corrupted offerings here is going to increase your corruption. But you just kind of see this is this typical kind of thing that we've seen so far. Demonic Aid over here giving you access to Keeper of Secrets, Blessing of Slanesh. So plenty of ways, uh, passive ability, feasting on fear for your aspiring champions. Like this is, you can make your aspiring champions so strong in this DLC and it is so damn fun. Um, erections, uh, I mean what, Erection of Ruinous Monuments makes it so anytime you build an altar it has a lot of benefits attached to it. And one thing I don't think I've really focused on in, in the three other videos on the champions is this one right here. Every single faction has got this of the new champions of chaos. And it is a way to basically pre-generate a marked hero. So you get sorcerers of Zinch and Slanesh, and you get exalted heroes of Korn or Nurgle, as far as this technology is concerned. So you get them coming out and also Path to Glory plus 50% levels kept when devoting a character to Slanesh. And we'll show that the Path to Glory off in a little bit here. But again, this is just a way to basically get dedicated heroes to your specific god without having to get them to level five and then devote them. And now with this technology, if you do devote them, they don't lose half their levels. They keep half that experience. So now that I get just 100%, they just go ahead and swap on over. But just to kind of highlight some of these really quick, showing them off. 
And you have your two right here that allow you to have an, another, an additional Gift of Slanesh and uh, so on and uh, so forth. So that is your technology tree. Let's move on over into some of the boons and the Gifts of Chaos. For the Gifts of Chaos and the boons, uh, these are all your standard Slanesh Gifts, but just to kind of highlight them really quick. These are the same ones that the Warriors of Chaos Undivided get, but of course you're focusing more on this because you know you get all the way down here to the Keeper of Secrets and the Soul Grinder. Uh, Keeper of Secrets has these spells by default, which is just Flash of Slanesh and Acquiescence. You can't get the full Paramore? That's not the word I want to use. A full panoply of spells. There you go. Um, but you get stuff like the Sonic Boom ability here, which is pretty cool. Experience gains. Um, I think there's some for Seduction on here. I can't remember... Um, but like I was saying, you're going to find stuff like this. Control minus 10 income from all buildings, 35%. So you want to use these. I think of all of the, the champions, with Sinesh, I found myself swapping uh, gifts a lot more than with the other ones. Where I was like, okay, this is just going to be the gift that I'm going to permanently lock into place and be good with it. Same thing, of course, here. Undivided has all the typical undivided ones. If you just, again, this isn't a guide, as I've always said, but Ruinous Bulwark, use it in the beginning because you're going to be smashing apart gates and you're going to go for... Um, Equation. And I really like Prophet of Pleasure followed by um, Exalted Chariot to get some Chariot action to really kind of help give you a bit of a power spike in the early game. Let's transition to some of the boons now. For the Path to Glory here, you can see on the Chaos Sorcerer, we have the ability to devote to either Lore of Slanesh or Lore of Shadows. And this is devoting to um, Slanesh outright. And as I've said with all the other videos, keep in mind that Transforming will be half the rank of their previous form and all skills will be reset to be chosen again. Any active boons, these right here, are lost upon transformation. You'll get a whole new set of them. So don't rely on those boons coming across with you. You will retain your trait though. Some people have been asking about that. Your trait does go with you. So that's nice to know. So you can see that your Chaos Sorcerer, they have a path to glory to ascend to devoting into Slanesh. Here is a Chaos Lord. They can also devote and become Slanesh. Uh, this is kind of crucial to understand because you can go into Ascend Demonhood. Um, and once you devote to Slanesh, this would, rather than saying Ascend Demonhood Undivided, it would say Ascend to Demonhood Slanesh. And... Sorcerer Lords can also do this. Nurgle and Slanesh are the only two factions that whose both Lords and um, Sorcerer Lords uh, can go to their respective god. I believe Corn is locked to their hero, or their, their Lord, obviously, right? No Sorcerer Lord for Corn. But Zinch, you cannot have a Lord go to Zinch, let alone an Exalted Hero go to Zinch. And that's the same thing with Slanesh. You cannot have an Exalted Hero go to Slanesh. In my assumption uh in the future we'll probably see that change you'll probably be able to get exalted sorcerer or um chaos sorcerers of nurgle and you'll probably be able to have exalted heroes of slanesh and uh zinch in the future but right now that is not the case so just kind of keep those in mind let's see how your path to glory works and that's everything so let's go over to a quick campaign summary of azazel because azazel is much harder and different than all the other campaigns of champions of chaos and it really it's a it's nice because the other three champions of chaos are comparatively so easy and not in, a, not in a not challenging way, and actually in quite a fun way. I don't. I never felt bored with the other three. Um, I just feel like oh, not not much poses a threat to me because I have so many tools at my disposal. And Azazel does have those same tools, but it is important to know that you're Slanesh, and Slanesh is very strong right now in multiplayer. But when you're playing in the campaign, Slanesh is second to worst in its auto resolve alongside Nurgle. Nurgle has a terrible auto resolve. So keep those things in mind because if you're not really good at the battles, this is going to be a harder campaign for you. If you're even if you're great at battles, it's still going to be a pretty hard campaign for you. Whereas I could play very hard, dare I say legendary on the other 3 and not sweat too much even on easy because I usually will do these on easy to blow through a real quick path to get an idea for, okay, what's the direction this campaign goes through, then go on a harder difficulty to see how hard it is to traverse that path. Let me tell you, you have got three options for Dark Fortresses. Remember, Dark Fortresses are the way that you're going to progress your campaign. Those Dark Fortress sites are crucial, as mentioned in the Chaos Rework. Here's your closest one. And it's Wei Jin. It's the capital of Cathay. It's not an easy settlement. This is a huge garrison. It's got something like four total celestial uh, guard, uh, dragon guard, whatever the hell they're called. And they're they're pretty beefy. It, 
on auto resolve on easy is a pyrrhic victory with a 20 stack and i had i was like let me just stuff this army and see how it goes so that's why you want to get stuff like shatterstone in your well shatterstone in your uh, your gifts as fast as possible and again i know this isn't a guide but i feel like i needed to tell you guys this because i struggled with this campaign to begin with because your next one is Nan Gao and uh, Miao Ying starts at strength rank one. She has a huge army. She's not one to be trifled with. Your other closest one is over here and it's Kairos Fate Weaver. It's not worth going to right here, the Volary. It's not worth going to because going through to fight Kairos, you do not get souls for fighting demons. It's just not worth it. So you have to blitz through the Turtle Gate and then jump into Wei Jin fast. It makes this a very challenging campaign because you do not have the capacity to expand to Dark Fortresses like you can with the Fecundites, right? You're surrounded by a lot of really cool options with um, Nurgle. And Nurgle actually has a, a slow time getting to them. Valkia has a diamond producing one right down the way. Or if you're playing as Village, you have so many Dark Fortresses options around you that it's just disgusting. So Azazel is a struggle because you will be up against odds from the start of the campaign. So if you're playing Champions of Chaos and you want a harder campaign, Azazel is the one for you. Now let's take a look at this from an Immortal Empire standpoint before kind of summing up, summarizing, summarizing <laughs> is this campaign right for you? Switching over to the Immortal Empires map, it is an immediate change of pace for Azazel. He has the capacity to spread his little wings and grow quite strong and fat. Whereas in the Realm of Chaos campaign, he has very few natural vassals. In the Immortal Empires campaign, he's surrounded by dark fortresses. He's surrounded by vassals that he can uh, he can choose. And the nice thing here is the Forbidden Citadel is a different homeland. So doing this one, and this one gives him two different sets of vassals and two different dark fortress sites. And he has expansion opportunities, less so much southeast, but plenty to the west, plenty to the north, and plenty to the northeast and east. So Azazel in Immortal Empires is a far easier start, especially because he can benefit from his capacity to increase his diplomatic relations with Kislev, Cathay, Bretonia, and Empire, because he's surrounded by those. So what I will say is, the Immortal Empires campaign is such a change of pace that it's almost like shockingly refreshing. It's so much better and easier when you're jumping into Immortal Empires as Azazel than Realm of Chaos. So if you do want a harder playthrough, jump on ROC. If you want to just be able to really let that Slaneshi wings unfurl, this is your benefit. On top of it, I mean, you have Nakari, not too far away, he's far away, and you have Bellacor, and you have Sigval. So those three are potential allies that you could take advantage of, and you have the ability to just pull the strings and machinations of everyone in the old world. Um, you're, of course, I mean, you're Slanesh, right? So you're not going to be chumming up with corn, but you do have the Fecundites, which are right here as well. So it's just a much... A much safer playthrough, to be totally honest with you. So, that is the Immortal Empires here for Azazel. So, let's answer that question. As I've said, is this campaign for you? And the big thing we want to take a look at is, is really the hard juxtaposition between the Immortal Empires and Realm of Chaos. Uh, and I think, by and large, almost everyone's trying to play Immortal Empires, right? We, it's what we've been waiting for for ages. But I think that it, to give a fair assessment of both, I must look at them both unbiased. Or in a bi uh, I gotta look at them both. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my point here is that the realm of chaos for Azazel is punishing, it is hard, it is difficult, you have very few vassal options, you really struggle to bring a lot of your capabilities as Slanesh online because you're going to be ripping through Cathay more than you're actually going to be seducing Cathay, which is huge. Uh, you're not going to be able to just pull the strings of humans, Norskins, um, well, Empire, Norskins, and Cathay, you just really kind of have... A little bit of Norskins to take advantage of in Cathay, and that's it. There's no other things to pull out of over there. So you really are going to be trying to burst into souls and then leave Cathay because you have so few Dark Fortress options. There are three total Dark Fortresses in Cathay. Wei Jin, Nangao, and uh, Shangyang Port. Uh, the three of the starting locations, right? Well, Wei Jin isn't a starting location, but the other two starting locations. So you want to kind of get out of Cathay as fast as possible using the Rift system. And I feel like that kind of slows the pace of your campaign. So the Realm of Chaos, if you want a punishing Realm of Chaos experience and you really want to dial the difficulty up for Champions of Chaos, then Azazel is that playthrough for you. Now on an Immortal Empire scope, if you want to play through 
in my opinion, probably the best, the best Slaneshi playthrough. I, I, people probably would argue with me and say it's Nakari because they really want to do Nakari and Ulthwan. But I think Azazel has more fun as Slanesh because you can really, really have fun with the seduce mechanic, uh, the seduction mechanic, which I've always found lackluster with Nakari. With the seduction budget increase, with the seduction cost reduction for Azazel, you can be seducing all these units into your army, reducing the other army's uh, fighting capability, increasing your auto-resolve capabilities, and just reaping through everyone. I, I find it way more fun. Sure, you don't benefit from the ability to really seduce entire um, dominate factions as well as Nakari does and Nakari is a real like bursty character but I like the utility and the fun and the flying capabilities of Azazel over Nakari personally so if you want an Immortal Empires campaign where you just sit in the northern chaos wastes in Norska just pulling at the strings of the old world and Kislev dude trust me Azazel is going to be a very fun undertaking for you so hopefully this kind of gives you a better idea of how Azazel plays in both IE and ROC. And it helps you answer that question of, is it a, the campaign for you? I think if I were to, now that we've done all four of them, if I were to rank them from fun, like most fun to least fun, I would probably put Village at the top because I really enjoyed Village. And I'd put Azazel somewhere in the middle because... It's such a struggle in the be in the beginning that you kind of like are, are lost. And you don't know what to do. So that kind of turned me off to it. But once I realized, okay, I'll just jump out of Cathay once I get the souls, it, it got a little more fun. But it just took too long for me to really get to that point for me to really enjoy it. But like I said, too, most people are going to be playing this as a mortal empire. So there you go, guys. Hopefully, again, that helps you out. And that covers all four of the Champions of Chaos. If you have any questions, any concerns, I'll be doing a series of videos where I talk about, hey, let's talk about the High Elf Legendary Lords in this same fashion for the Immortal Empires, which will be a, a shorter format. I won't go into all every little bit nitty gritty bit of detail, but just kind of go into how their individual campaigns play. If you want to see a specific uh, race first, go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. Like, hey, do Beastmen first. No one's covering Beastmen. Whatever it is, let it be known. But as always, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.